Thanks, Athena. Uh, and thanks for continuing to organize this. I think it's been really, really great in a way to stay connected in spite of it all. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a, about a story w without any results or conclusion, really, so to speak. And there will probably never be any results or conclusion because I've been applying for funding for this project for five years. And, and I think I've reached my limit of NSF proposals that I can stomach. Um, so the story is, is, is one that I started thinking about shortly after I finished my PhD. For my PhD, I, res I uh, did a, a systematic revision of a, of a group of scorpions, um, the one that's being consumed in this, in this picture. Uh, the, it's a group called the bark scorpions, and they are distributed from essentially from southwestern U.S. through to northern South America. Um, they're they're notable, I think, for for the primary reason that they're notable is because in in some parts of their distribution, they're capable of delivering lethal envenomations to humans, um, and so that that makes them a medical concern, and. Uh, prior to the start of, of my revision, they had never been treated systematically. They had never been holistically treated in terms of their taxonomy. So they were kind of kind of a mess. And when you pair um, lethal envenomations with uncertain taxonomy, what you get is a is a problem, and 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 particularly one for developing effective antivenins for 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 individual species. Luckily, there's a there's an antivenom that has reduced. The number of lethal envenomations in Mexico from about a thousand annually down to to probably under a hundred. Um, although we probably are underestimating, given that in much of their range they're in relatively remote areas, and the medical presentation of these envenomations is is a heart attack in many cases <clears throat> or hypo, hypotension, hypertension, hypertension. Um, so I was really excited when I saw this this study come out um, by Ashley and Matthew Rao, uh, who were looking at a, a, a species that has an overlapping distribution for for a large part of the distribution of this group, um, with with centuroides with the bark scorpions, and it's this adorable or perhaps very vicious little mouse uh, called some oftentimes called the scorpion mouse or the grasshopper mouse. Um, it's it's a, a species complex a species a genus of four species, uh, and they're mostly in the North American desert, so um, the western, southwestern U.S. And, and northwestern Mexico. And they uh, are predators. They predate primarily on nocturnal arthropods, um, but they seem to be uh, quite uh, interested in, in consuming uh, arachnids, in particular scorpions. And um, their gut, con gut content analyses of these guys showed that they that scorpions make up a large proportion of their diet. Um, so I think it makes sense to wonder how um, a mouse that certainly weighs considerably less than an adult human is capable of, of consuming these highly venomous arthropods with apparent impunity, um, where a, a similar dosage of venom could could kill a, an otherwise healthy adult human. Um, and so Ashley and, and, and Matt Rao started, started looking at these guys and, and comparing the uh, effect of the Im immunological response of these mice on exposure to venom from different populations of scorpions. So they were taking, going out to the field, collecting mice and scorpions from multiple uh, geographic locations, and then um, envenomating the mice with scorpion venom harvested from this from the same geographic location or from different geographic locations to, to assess whether there was a populational effect of their immunological response. Um, and along the way, they were also interested in what per, what in particular this this response was, how how these mice were coping with scorpion venom. Um, and what what they found actually was that the the the, the immune the immune response of the mice varied on a populational level. So um, mice from different populations were uh, had a less effective response to scorpions from different geographic areas um, than they did to scorpion venom from the same geographic harvested from the same geographic area of the mouse. Um, that was the first interesting thing, which suggested that um, the the evolution of these two was occurring over a really rapid 
and short time scale uh, at the population level and is continuing to, to, to evolve and adapt. So this one of these, an example of one of the so-called evolutionary arms races. Um, and the second thing that they found was that these mice, the, in, the immune response to the scorpion venom was uh, cr converting those molecules, those peptides that are, that are specific to the, to the nervous system. So they're either um, uh, uh, neuron inhibitors or activators. They were taking these neuron activators that were, that were channeling the pain uh, sensory network and converting them into analgesics. So they were taking something that was supposed to cause pain and allow the scorpion to escape and instead creating a painkiller out of it, which is a, a really effective thing to do as a predator uh, in consuming your prey. Um, so one of the, the interesting things that I should point out is, is that these scorpions, these bark scorpions, possess an arsenal of, of venom components, of, of peptides primarily in their, in their venom. Um, they, a single individual can produce up to 200 unique uh, molecules that it expresses in its venom gland um, and, in, and ejects in its venom cocktail. And, and most of these, the majority of these are, are uh, neurotoxins that again, target, target the nervous system, oftentimes the pain pathways. Uh, typically they're, they're uh, uh, highly specialized and so they will produce venoms that are both active on the insect um, neural pathways as well as the mammalian neural pathways. Uh, and they also produce peptides that target the, the sodium channels, the potassium channels, and the calcium channels. Uh, the, the paper that came out from out of the Rao lab really got me thinking about how how these scorpions are, are producing this venom and, and what is comprised in their, in their venom cocktail. And, and the reason that I was thinking about it is because through this taxonomic revision that I did as, during my PhD, I realized that all of the highly venomous species that are, that are notable for, for lethal envenomations in humans belong to a single clade sharing a single common ancestor. Um, so I started to think about, about whether or not there was natural selection, in particular natural selection to evade predation from a predator that was capable of dealing with their venom um, occurring right about the time that 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 the that they would have first come into contact with these with these mice um, so i uh during my phd or actually right after my phd i i uh, started creating some time calibrated trees to try to understand when the period of time that this clade would have first interacted with these with these scorpion mice could have been um and and i the date that i recovered for that for that group that highly venomous group was about the time of the emergence of the North American deserts, um, which would have preceded uh, uh, the the cladogenesis of these mice, but certainly would they wouldn't have been far behind. And 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 as the scorpions uh, expanded northward and the mice expanded southward um, in their ranges, they would have come into contact, and and these this group of scorpions would have faced a, a, a predator that was already used to eating scorpion prey from, from other groups that, that don't possess these mammalian neurotoxins. Um, so in addition to all these neurotoxins that the scorpions are producing, they produce a number of other things. And, and there's been this uh, hypothesis proposed called the, the venom conservation hypothesis, which suggests that because these large peptide molecules are relatively expensive metabolically, you'd wanna use the least amount of venom in any given circumstance. The other things that are present in the cocktails of these scorpion venoms are um, smaller molecules, mostly enzymes, and and those enzymes are 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 really effective at breaking down cells. So if you're if you're a predator like a scorpion, and you want to uh, subdue your prey, you you might only need enzymes and salts to to subdue prey that's much smaller than you that you can also mechanically crush with your hands, um, which is precisely the behavior that we often observe. Um, another paper was published a few years ago that, that looked at this one species of scorpion that produces a pre-venom droplet. Um, and so essentially what they do is th these, the, these, this is a South African species of scorpion and when they're excited, they produce a tiny little droplet of venom that hangs on the end of their telson. Um, and some researchers har harvested that venom and then compared the composition of that pre-venom to the total crude venom that they got from, from electrostimulating the venom gland. 
And they found that the pre-venom was mostly comprised of these small molecules like enzymes and salts, um, whereas the, the, the total venom had the larger molecules like neuropeptides. So it got me thinking about this idea that perhaps venom and venom and scorpions in particular that can produce hundreds of, of unique components is because it's metabolically expensive, perhaps these scorpions would want to use the least amount of venom in, in any given circumstance. So if they're, if they're predating on prey, um, they'd mostly be using enzymes and salts. And if they're, if they're defending their lives, they would use, they would rely on the larger uh, neurotoxins um, that are active on the mammalian nervous system. I have no idea if they have any way to control what venom components they're, they're using at any given time in any given en envenomation event. Um, and and it, the, it's kind of hard to, to figure that out because uh, you, can, you can get them to, you can mechanically stimulate them to, to elicit like a, a defensive sting that you can collect the venom from just off of a, uh, like a wire frame with a piece of wax paper wrapped around it. It will, it, they'll, it, they'll sting it and there'll be a little nice droplet left and you can collect that droplet. However, to, sim to, to simulate a, a, a predation attack, the scorpion eating something, the only way to really simulate that effectively is to give it a prey item. Um, and so if, in doing that, they've now injected the venom into the prey item and, and it's difficult to, to recover um, just and isolate just the, the components of the venom. So, so I got to thinking that maybe RNA-seq would be sort of a roundabout way of trying to assess what these, these scorpions were, were injecting and, and whether they are able to control what venom they're, they're using at any, in any given scenario. Um, so, so we set up these three experimental groups. One was just a control where we just threw a scorpion in a freezer after 48 hours of moving it from one box back, at, back at, to another. Um, another was uh, a, a, a defensive strike. So we put these scorpions in a box. We just agitated them until they fought back and, and kept agitating them until they depleted their, their venom stock or were no longer injecting venom um, in, during a sting. And then the last group was we gave them a, a novel prey item, um, a, we standardized cricket that was lab reared. Uh, so, so we took each of these experimental groups, we, we um, threw them in a freezer, we harvested their venom glands, uh, and we looked for, for patterns of, of gene expression um, in each of these venom glands. And this was a, a super preliminary study. Uh, we had five individuals in each experimental group. Um, they weren't control. They were all adults, but we didn't control for for sexes. We just assigned individuals to a random group. Uh, we sequenced them, and we looked we looked at, at whether there was any significant differences in the patterns of gene expression among them. So uh, here here's what we see. Uh, in fact, the the what's being expressed in each of these three groups is is some, is fairly significantly different. Um, in, in this graph, you can see this, this is just a, a, a heat plot of, of similarity of total, total gene expression or total RNA-seq expression. And uh, in, in, in the red bar at the top and on the, on the left are the control groups. So they didn't have any envenomation event, nothing happened. And so mostly what they're expressing are, are housekeeping cellular genes. Um, and in blue is the defensive gene, so that's the scorpions that were subjected to some harsh treatment and, and uh, stung in defense. And in green were the offensive um, scorpion, scorpions that, that received a uh, cricket that they got to sting and then subsequently eat. And you can see that certainly the, both of the, the groups that were subjected to some envenomation event are, are producing um, genes that are very different from those of the control. And uh, they're also producing, for the most part, genes that are different from one another. And here, here's sort of a, a different view through some volcano plot views. Uh, and these are, again, these are just pairwise comparisons. So comparing two different experimental groups, control, defense, control, predation, and defense predation. Again, we see that in the in the both the con of the control versus predation and defense groups, there's a lot of significantly different expression levels. Um, we have no idea what most of these are. There's no uh, fully annotated genome for scorpions, so we have no idea what some of them are. The the handy thing is is uh, for a lot of these neurotoxins, they have a, a constrained cysteine scaffold, 
So you can oftentimes predict that the function of the gene is, is a venom gene because the cysteine scaffold is present. So we're able to figure out, a, a, like have some hints on, on the basis of that. And then um, anything that, that obviously maps back to like a, the Drosophila genome, we have a pretty good idea of, of what that's doing. Um, I, for me, the one that's the most interesting is the defense versus predation down on the bottom. Here, you can see that the, the, the levels of significant difference are, are much lower. So each of those individual dots represents um, a pairwise comparison of, gene exp of a single gene being expressed or an ortholog being expressed. Uh, here, you can see that the, there's a lot less red, which is the significance cutoff that we, that we assigned it. And uh, what those red things are, I have no idea for the most part. Uh, <laughs> so that that's that's my story about about trying to assess whether scorpions can can control what genes they're they're producing. I don't. I still don't really know um, because we didn't harvest the venom itself. We can't compare the uh, RNA seq data to the to the chemical composition of the venom, which would be the most ideal scenario. Um, we don't really know whether they are activating genes because they had an experience and think that they might need more of that kind of venom in the future or whether they're activating those genes to replenish that component of the venom which got used up. Um, so these are still a lot of, I think, outstanding questions. Um, here's, a, here's sort of a, a, a blow up of, of that one defense versus predation uh, plot, um, and you know, I think like that's sort of where where I'm left with this story. Uh, again, I at the beginning I told you I was going to tell you a story, and that it had no no real results or real conclusion. Um, and that's probably always going to be the case until somebody else wants to do it because I'm sick of applying applying for NSF funding. So uh, with that, I just want to say thanks to all the people that helped or listened to me talk about this endlessly. Um, and thanks for having me, Athena. Thanks, Lauren. Anybody have any questions or suggestions? Great. OK, awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, Aaron has a question. Hi, that was a Hello. good story. Um, I just have a quick question. Is it possible to sort of coerce a scorpion to, you know, have like, for example, a cricket or something, and then try to quickly get that paraffin wax on the scorpion sting before it actually attacks the prey item? Like just sort of like, yeah. you know, quick reflex sort of thing? Well, you know, I, I have some, I have a lot of ideas for how I would be able to, to harvest venom from a, a predation attack, mm -hmm. um, if I ever had the money to do the research. Um, one idea that I had was to, to, to just um, make sort of like a, like a little hollow robot prey item that they would then sting and, and eject the venom into. But um, I don't, you know, what, what do you, what do you know? Who know? I'm not, I'm like, at some point you just get sick of applying for, the, for, for funding to do a project and you realize that it must, something about it must be a bad idea. So, right. say, la vie. say la vie, Aaron. Welcome to Scorpion Research. Well, I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, sorry to, you got disillusioned. I, whatever. I have, I've got other ideas that I'm more excited about. Cool. All right. Sounds Somebody good. else had a question too. Uh, are any, it was Tatiana, are any annotations of those differently expressed genes possible? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can do annotations um, to some extent. Like, for example, we can we can infer function of, of the neurotoxins based on cysteine scaffolding, and we can um, map things back to like Drosophila genomes or other, or other um, fully annotated genomes of arthropods. So, we can, we, yeah, we can, but I don't, I don't know. If somebody wants to pay me, I'll do it. Otherwise, whatever. It was an interesting question, and I answered it enough for my own purposes. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Lauren. All right.
Our next speaker is also another great friend of mine, Dr. Pem Pim Tong Sring Pong. Uh, she is a postdoc at the Cal Academy in the microbiology department, and she's going to talk about RNA viruses in mosquitoes. All right, let me present it on my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Athena, for the introduction. Again, my name is Pan Pim, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the California Academy of Science. And I am working with mosquitoes and mosquito RNA viruses in microbiology department with Dr. Shan Bennett. And um, so today I'm going to be talking about how we can use RNA seq for RNA virus discovery. So we change the gear a little bit, and instead of looking at transcriptomes of you know um, gene expression. We're going to be using RNA seq to characterize genomes of organisms that has RNA. Sorry, we're going to be using RNA seq to characterize organisms that has RNA as their genomes. Um, so, um, let me. Um, okay. So today, um, we're going to be talking about mosquito-borne diseases, and um, a lot of these. Diseases are transmitted by, um, are caused by RNA viruses, as you can see here, Zika, Dengue, um, West Nile, and Yellow Fevers. And a lot of these viruses cause a lot of, um, excuse me, I think somebody. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so a lot of these um, diseases are caused by RNA viruses, and you can see that it's caused significant threat to public health. Um, so for example, dengue virus alone caused over 96 million cases a year. Um, and um, even though a lot of these viruses can cause diseases in human, um, they not all cause, you know, can cause diseases in a host or in a human. So this is an example of, um, oops, sorry about that. So this is um, a picture from a recent publication that was published in Nature in 2016, and they use next generation sequencing to characterize RNA viruses in many invertebrate species. And you can see in the picture here, all the red um, um, branch represent new viruses that they discover in this paper alone. And you can see there's tons and tons of, of virus that still need to be discovered in many families of viruses. And these are multiple invertebrate species, including mosquitoes as well. Um, and after this publication, there's you know many more studies that that um, have been cho have shown a lot of um, diversity of viruses in invertebrates. So why do we want to discover viruses? Obviously, we want to understand virus evolution and diversification. And because some of these viruses can cause disease in human, we can use RNA seq in diagnostics. You know, um, in the future, um, we hope that it could be used in routine diagnostics. If we discover new um, viruses, maybe we can harvest them, ha harness them for application in biotechnology or biomedical. And a little more relevant to today's um, problem, we want to also monitor zoonotic viruses, so viruses that infect animals, and see if they can have potential in causing diseases in human as well. So there's many reasons why we want to discover um, viruses. And you may know that a lot of these viruses have RNA 
So some virus has DNA, as you know, a lot of this has RNA. So obviously we're gonna be using RNA sequencing to characterize the genomes of these RNA viruses. So um, there's a quick overview of how this work. You have your samples, it could be water, you know, which has bacteria in them. So you'll be characterized bacteria, RNA virus, I mean, sorry, DNA viruses. You, uh, in, in this study, we focus on mosquitoes. So my samples are pool of multiple mosquitoes individuals. And so I ground these up, I ground the mosquitoes up into mosquito slushy and then extracted RNA from this um, mosquitoes. And then this is a mixture of RNA, right? And a lot of these are gonna be mosquito RNA. And the majority of the mosquito RNA are ribosomal RNA. And what we really actually want to sequence are uh, the microbial RNA, which are tiny a bit, tiny bit, tiny amount um, in this mixture. So one option you could do is to remove the host ribosomal RNA first in the lab. Um, and you can do this or you can skip this as well. Um, I've done it in both way. And then you can transcribe the RNA into complementary DNA. And then after that, you just do library prep and treat it as you know DNA um, and do sequencing. And so for this specific talk, other than trying to discover virus in the mosquito, we also ask specific question, and that is what determine mosquito virus community composition? Is it the habitat of the mosquito, or is it the species of the mosquito? of this mosquito that is important in determining what kind of virus we're gonna see in the pool, in the samples. And our hypothesis is that because the virus is so species specific, they need to have this molecular compatibility in order to function inside the host. We think that the species of the host or the mosquito is gonna be a, a important factor in determining what kind of virus we're gonna see inside the host. And so to answer that question, um, we went back to our freezer. And um, in the past, we've done field work in Thailand where we characterized the diversity of mosquitoes and their microbiome across a landscape gradient from forest to urban. So we went to all these habitats in these gradients of um, landscapes and then collect all the mosquitoes and asking question, how does diversity of mosquitoes and their microbiome change across these different types of habitats? And for this specific study, we've selected three habitat types, uh, the rural, um, the pictures are shown to the left, suburb, and then urban. And in each of these habitat types, we selected three uh, species of mosquito of different genera. The Culex mosquito, Culex fuscocephala, Amitris, um, and then Mansonia mosquitoes. So in total, we have nine samples of this combination of habitat and species. And in each sample, we have uh, pulled 25 samples together. Uh, sorry, 25 individual of mosquito together into one, one pool. So nine pools of 25 mosquitoes. And then, um, we also test out ribosomal depletion, ribosomal RNA depletion using lab-made uh, probes. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we did this. So we started with a mosquito from the lab. So they, uh, our mosquito pets that we have, and then we extracted the DNA from this mosquito and then do PCR to amplify the ribosomal DNA of the mosquitoes. And then we reverse transcribe, so make RNA from this DNA. So we have ribosomal RNA from this PCR. And then we also add biotin label nucleotide into this mixture. So we end up with this label ribosomal RNA probes. And then when we have our RNA samples that we uh, extracted from our actual sample, we hybridize this probe with our samples, with our RNA sample. So the probe is gonna bind to mosquito ribosomal RNA in our sample. And then we just separate and throw out the um, bound mosquito ribosomal RNA. So, 
at the end, we left with some mosquito uh, mRNA or other type of uh, RNA and relatively more microbial RNA. And then after that, we um, change this to cDNA and then do library prep and sequence. And so this is a quick overview of our results. The RD samples here represent the samples that have gone through ribosomal depletion steps. And then the UD samples are the one that didn't go through this uh, ribosomal uh, RNA depletion steps. And we found more virus in, in those samples that have depleted ribosomal RNA. We also have higher percentage of virus reads in those samples, as well as higher depth for the virus. And these are significant difference. <clears throat> and then after that, we can classify the virus read that we found. Um, and in this graph, so the top uh, panel here show the species of the mosquito, Amiteris, Culex, and then Mansonia. And then at the bottom are the uh, habitat that the mosquito will collect it from and whether the sample have gone through the ribosomal RNA depletion step or not. And the colors represent different group of viruses that were classified for each sample. And you can start seeing that there's some pattern uh, that you can observe already. And then um, we can also classify them further using phylogenetic analysis to determine what clades of the virus family these new viruses belong to. And the red ones represent the new virus that we, the virus that we have discovered in our study. And so I'm not going to go into details here, but just to show you that we discover many new viruses um, in these mosquitoes. Um, the other question is whether we can use RNA-seq data to characterize non-virus microbes. And in fact, we could, so this is a similar graph, but for bacteria. Again, the top is the mosquito species, and then the bottom is the habitats and the sample types, and the colors represent different types of bacteria groups that were classified on these uh, bacteria reads. And in fact, we can use RNA-seq data to classify many other, type, other types of uh, organisms. And this is the percentage of virus, re uh, sorry, the percentage of reads classified using Kraken that belong to either bacteria, fungi, um, nematodes, and all kinds of and, uh, organisms. And notice though that a lot of these reads are still the one that belong to arthropods are probably mosquitoes, and about one to 3% can't be classified um, using this software. <clears throat> so if we want to go further, uh, deep down to see what exactly what type of bacteria, not just at the family level or other level, we want to know what, what bacteria they are. We can also actually pull out the um, 16S RNA read and then uh, use phylogenetic analysis to, to characterize these reads. And for example, here we found many, many kinds of bacteria and other organisms, but just an example here. Uh, we found likely a new species, a new group of bacteroidetes bacteria that are likely specific to mosquitoes. You can see here it's classified, uh, it's uh, cl grouped with other bacteria, bacteroidetes clades that are specific to bees and termites. So this, what we found in the mosquito could be um, similar bacteria that is specific to mosquitoes. Um, we also found things like termitodes are likely a new species that infect bats. So just some example of what we could find um, in the RNA-seq data. And so this is the last slide to answer that first question that was asked. Um, so what did you mean the virus composition, the virome composition in the mosquito? Is it the species of the mosquito or is it the habitats? And so we use PCA to analyze the pattern of, of virus presence absence across these samples. So on the left hand side, we did this for bacteria just for comparison and on the right hand for virus. And you can see that in the case of virus presence absent, each sample are grouped based on the colors of the dots. So each dot is, uh, is, is 
each dot is each sample. So each sample group based on the colors, which represents species of the host, and not the shape of the dot, which is the habitat. So the virus community um, the group were determined primarily by the host species. The habitat might be important, but it's not as important compared to, to the species of the host. And in case of bacteria, we don't really see any effort grouping pattern. So for bacteria case, it's a little more complicated than, than virus. So just to quickly conclude for this um, little small project, mosquito-associated viral component was determined um, primarily by the host species, rather than by geographical location or habitat, at least from our nine samples that, that we used. Um, and ribosomal RNA depletion may help improve next-gen sensitivity in detecting low viral sequence. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all the collaborators. So this is part of the larger study where we characterize diversity of mosquitoes and microbiome and environment across different habitat gradients. And so a lot of people were involved in the field work. And also a lot of lab work was done by Shannon's previous postdoc, James Angus. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for listening and uh, I would be happy to take any question if you have any. There we go. All right, well, sorry about that. And uh, um, I'll just get right into it. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the work I've been doing uh, studying the uh, evolution of frog visual systems using transcriptomics. And so this is a large collaborative project that we're uh, conducting where we're trying to integrate across multiple different aspects of visual evolution, including spectral analyses, molecular evolution, and morphology to see what effects things like different habitats, activity patterns, and life history might have had on the evolution uh, of these visual systems across frogs. And so as I mentioned, this is a large collaborative project, and I'd just like to kind of acknowledge my collaborators right off the bat uh, with these nice photos back uh, from the olden times when we were allowed to uh, you know, see each other in person. And so why might we be interested in uh, studying uh, evolution of frog visual systems? It's because frogs are actually really highly uh, visual animals, and they have these very diverse ecologies and behaviors. And so this can be things like nocturnal free frogs that have log large eyes, uh, we have a uh, lot of burrowing species that actually still maintain highly developed eyes. And then you have some things like these uh, aquatic frogs that have these really tiny beady eyes that might even be hard to see. And then there's even a couple cases uh, where frogs might have uh, UV reflectance, which tends to be very interesting to us since we cannot ourselves see in the UV, but many other animal groups can. And so the main aspect that we're looking at is how these visual systems might have adapted to these different lifestyles, comparing things like diurnal versus nocturnal, nocturnally active frogs, aquatic versus non-aquatic, um, fossorial, so burrowing in, or living underground, and then uh, scansorial or climbing adapted or arboreal uh, species. And so the methods that I'm using uh, as my part of this product uh, is, is two different things. One is using uh, whole eye transcriptomes uh, and using this to be able to extract the uh, visual gene transcripts, as well as a targeted capture approach that allows us to get uh, complete coding sequences from visual genes. And this is very useful to expand our sample beyond the animals where we're able to get fresh tissue since we need that to do the uh, transcriptomes. And so in total, we're uh, targeting a large number of species that kind of span the entire frog tree of life. So we've currently sequenced uh, 50 whole eye transcriptomes and we have 96 more planned for sequencing. And I think the, the next batch of 48 has actually just been sent to the sequencing facility this week. And as I said, I'm also designing this target capture project targeting around 288 species. And I've designed baits to target visual genes as well as other sensory genes and uh, other things of interest uh, to allow us to like I said, expand that sampling. And this data will be used uh, in studies of molecular evolution, as well as a few targeted studies of differential gene expression, which will be what I uh, tell you about today. And so before I can get into that, I just wanna give you a very brief background on visual systems to help perhaps put some of these results in context. So the frog eye shown here is very similar to a typical vertebrate eye. And I'll just point out uh, two key uh, features, uh, one being the lens. So the lens is what uh, focuses uh, light onto the retina uh, shown here. 
and the composition of the lens, including its shape, as well as the different proteins that make up the lens, can have a large effect on the different uh, optics within the visual system, determining how well an animal can see. And some uh, animals will use uh, pigments in the lens to actually filter out uh, some wavelengths of light. This is most typically done uh, with UV light in diurnal species in order to uh, help protect the eye from UV damage. And also just show you a brief schematic of the uh, retina shown here, which is this multi-layered neural tissue that contains the uh, rod and cone uh, photoreceptors. And in particular, these photoreceptors actually contain the light sensitive aspect of the visual system. So these are the light sensitive visual pigments, and these are made up of an opsin protein and a different uh, vitamin A based chromophore showing here the vitamin uh, A1 chromophore. And visual pigments absorb a characteristic wavelength of light. So this is a, a normalized absorption curve of what this visual pigment uh, would absorb, um, showing it absorbing well, within the green, uh, primarily within the green part of the spectrum. And so differences in the, uh, the protein component here can actually shift this absorption spectrum, showing here uh, a shift to uh, the red and a shift to the blue. But we can also shift the absorption spectrum of visual pigments by utilizing a different chromophore. So here, switching from that vitamin A1 chromophore to the vitamin A2 chromophore uh, also results in a shift into the red. And so one of the ways that uh, visual systems will adapt is to changes in the light environment. And an example of this uh, is seen in different species of fish that inhabit clear water versus turb turbid water. And so these uh, different fish species will uh, utilize different combinations of opsin proteins, uh, different chromophores, as well as different levels of expression of those uh, opsin proteins. But I think frogs are actually a really interesting system to study this in because they actually transition through ontogeny from uh, using an aquatic uh, to a terrestrial habitat in many species, but not and not in all. And this difference in aquatic versus uh, uh, vision in aquatic environments versus vision on land is actually quite different optically and presumably will have substantial effects uh, in terms of what visual systems might be best adapted uh, in these environments. And so I was interested in using uh, a pilot project to look at how does visual gene expression change in uh, tadpoles versus juvenile frogs. And so we set up a uh, pilot project using the southern leopard frog shown here. And so we have a comparison between tadpoles and adults. And we also have two treatments that we put these under, that being uh, light adapting and dark adapting. So keeping the, the animals in the light or, or the DAC before extracting the eye and the RNA from it. Um, and this is just to test uh, what might uh, what effect this might have on um, on our broader uh, cross species comparison, where we might not actually have as tight a control on the light conditions uh, when the animals were um, when the, when the RNA was uh, extracted. And so, uh, just showing here uh, uh, the, the first bit of results here, just comparing the different samples to each other in a PCA plot. Um, in terms of their uh, expression levels, you can see that there's a really nice, a strong separation between the juveniles and the tadpoles, and uh, not much difference really between the uh, treatments that we put in the, in the light versus the uh, dark. So this was kind of what we were hoping to see uh, at the get-go and was kind of reassuring. And so looking then uh, transcriptome-wide, doing a differ differential expression analysis with DSeq2, uh, we could see across all uh, across this whole transcriptome, comparing just the tadpoles uh, to the juveniles, there's a large number of differentially expressed genes. Um, and many of these genes are actually um, not related to vision, as we might expect. There's a lot of, of genes that are related to uh, metabolism and, and development. And uh, this is part of the product that I am uh, currently still uh, working to finish the analysis of. But kind of reassuring for us in terms of the light versus dark is we see very little difference uh, uh, between these two uh, treatments on, on the overall results. But really what I'm actually interested in is the visual gene. So I also did a targeted study uh, where we just looked at differential expression uh, across uh, a set of uh, genes that are known to be involved in vision. And so if we then look at uh, what that looks like in terms of the uh, juvenile versus tadpole, Again, we have a fair number of differentially expressed genes, which is great. And the light versus dark actually has very little difference uh, with these kind of minor treatments. And again, this is what we kind of hope to see and uh, makes, it, uh, makes it nice for us that our um, comparative data sets are not likely to be uh, highly biased, biased versus uh, uh, 
not controlling light conditions exactly. And so I'll just walk through a couple of the uh, interesting uh, genes that came up as differentially expressed in this juvenile versus tadpole comparison. And the first one of these is this gene CYP27C1, which is significantly upregulated regulated in tadpoles. And this gene has actually been shown to control the shift between that vitamin A1 to that vitamin A2 chromophore. And so this would actually result in a red shift in the uh, absorption spectrum of the visual pigments. And this is often found in freshwater species that uh, inhabit these uh, very red shifted environments due to the uh, turbidity of uh, freshwater and this is actually exactly what we find when we look at the absorption spectra uh, in these tadpoles versus the adults. We can see that the tadpole does util utilize the vitamin A2 chromophore, and it has this red shifted uh, absorption spectrum relative uh, to the juvenile. And this had been shown uh, previously in other species of, of frogs in, in terms of the differential uses, usage of vitamin A2 in tadpoles and vitamin A1 in adults. And so it was great to see that this kind of was validated with our uh, RNA-seq results. Another uh, interesting uh, set of genes that popped up were these lens crystallins. And so these are the structural proteins that make up the lens. And these differences actually suggest that lens function uh, may be shifting going from tadpoles to juveniles. And this is probably related to uh, vision in the air versus uh, water. And so this is something we'll need to uh, look into further, but uh, giving us these first hints about these uh, functional changes, perhaps in the optics of vision. And finally, I'll just talk about the uh, differential expression of opsin genes. So most of the opsins uh, showed uh, pretty much a high amount of variation and, and no evidence for significant differential expression. The exception to this was actually this uh, SWS2 opsin, uh, which is a blue sensitive opsin, and it showed highly up regulation in juveniles. And this is potentially interesting because this gene also pops up in our uh, interspecific data set. And so this will be something we have to uh, look into further perhaps is indicating uh, a shift um, in the visual spectrum beyond the shift that's already uh, obtained from that switch from that A1 to that A2 uh, chromophore. So going forward, uh, what I'd like to do with this is expand out to additional comparisons in other species and so that we can compare things that have aquatic tadpoles and aquatic adults uh, to things that have uh, other combinations of activity uh, of habitats, all the way to comparing things that don't have tadpoles at all, that actually direct develop terrestrially and also have terrestrial adults and see how differential gene expression, uh, as well as other aspects of the visual evolution um, track in these different, different groups of frogs. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge again, my collaborators, as well as uh, the funding sources that we had for this project and uh, the, the Bell Lab at the Smithsonian and uh, California Academy of uh, sciences, and I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I mean, thank you, Ryan. Um, is there any questions for Ryan? Um, I have a question. I'm not, I'm not sure if I should say that in the chat. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I would, hi, Brian. Brian, that was a super interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, so it seems like you have a few different candidate loci that um, seem to underlie this, like, this shift between, like, dark and light environments and um, tadpoles and frogs. And I was wondering if you were planning later on to do, like, a comparative genomic approach by looking to see, like, whether or not nearby species that might have, like, different um, environmental conditions, or, like, different, like, I guess, like, discrete boundaries between like light and dark. I wonder whether or not they, um, you're trying to like, to like to look across them to see if there's like any like specific regions that are getting, that might be influenced or modified in those. That makes uh, sense. Yeah, yeah that, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it, it would be great to do like genomic resources and frogs are pretty limited right now, but yeah. it is something that is quickly growing. Um, mm -hmm. So actually getting whole genome sequences is still pretty difficult because the genomes are pretty large. Um, but kind of long term, I think that would be, be a great thing to do is look at the regulation uh, of some of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, are there nearby or like closely related species that seem to have a that have, like, I guess, like more variable, like light conditions? Or oh, like, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, there's, there's lots of there's lots of shifts across the tree. And uh, one of the thing that that's one of the things we're definitely trying to target in our interspecific data set is a lot of these shifts in 
light uh, environments as well as uh, activity patterns and other kind of life history traits. Cool. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, there's one more question for you, but if that's okay oh. with you, Ryan, um, if we could take it via chat, because we're running a little late and we have one more speaker. Yeah, no problem. Great. Thank you. Um, so our last speaker today is is Dr. Joe Harris. Joe is currently a postdoc at Berkeley. He's about to start as a professor at CSU San Bernardino. Joe's going to talk about rockfish. Hello, everyone. Can, can you see my slides? Yes. OK. All right. Yeah, so hi. Thank you, Athena, for, for inviting me. And uh, yes, uh, so I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley, the Department of Integrated Biology and the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Um, I'm in Chris Martin's lab, and currently I'm working on pupfish gut microbiomes, but today I'm going to talk about rockfish transcriptomics. This is work that I did as a PhD student at UC Merced, and um, I just wanted to share this uh, study that I did, and that was published last year. And so what is it about rockfishes? What is it that is so exciting to, to study this group of fishes, right? So as you can see from this collage that you see uh, a variety of differences in morphologies, um, also color patterns. Uh, a lot of these species occupy uh, different depth profiles, and also there's differences in longevity. So some species can live up to 100 years or even 200 years, where other species can only live up to maybe you know, 12 or 14 years. Right? And so all these species are encompassed in one genus, uh, Sebastes, and there's over 105 different species. And so for my PhD work, one of the central questions that I was asking is, what are the genes that contribute to this adaptive radiation? So a little bit more about rockfishes, right? So the phylogeny of rockfishes uh, was published by Heidenvetter. And so as you can see on the left, uh, it's the phylogeny. You can see a color uh, bar on, on the far right of, of each taxa. And that's just uh, corresponding to the bio, um, biogeographical location of where they're distributed. So as you can see that most species are found off the coast of North America and also in Asia. But for today, my talk only focuses on five species um, uh, that I've collected off the coast of California. So I collected um, out of Monterey and Santa Cruz. So the five species that I had collected um, are these five here. So gopher, china, quillback, blue, and olive rockfishes. And, um, and what I did was I extracted uh, the brain tissue and used that for my uh, transcriptomic uh, libraries. And the reason why I use uh, brain transcriptomes is that at the given time, there was no genome available. And so what I used was the brain tissue in the sense that there was the most amount of transcripts being expressed within a given tissue, or that, that's what studies have shown. And so that's what I use uh, for in a comparative analysis across these five species. And as you can see that they occupy different depths, right? They have different depth profiles. Another thing to note, if you see that line that goes across, um, this was adapted from Sable et al. And this is just the oxygen concentration that you see in the California current. So as you can see, uh, the amount of oxygen available differs, you know, as you go you know, throughout the depths of, you know, this profile here. So this is something that I kept in mind in my study. And so what I've done was that with the transcriptome, instead of just looking at uh, gene expression profiles, um, I was interested in just looking at uh, protein coding genes, but also looking at mutations across um, orthologous genes. So orthologous is the same gene, but different species. And so uh, what I was interested in is looking at um, estimating positive selection. So what does that look like? So here's my, an example where you can see that I have these two gene sequences from two individuals. And here I'm highlighting one where there's a mutation. Um, and if we were to look at the amino acid sequence, uh, there would be no consequence. So this is a synonymous substitution, right? And if we look at this other site here, um, where we do see a mutation as well, but if we look at the amino acid sequence, that there is a non-synonymous substitution, there is a consequence, right? So this accumulation of non-synonymous substitutions in respect to synonymous substitutions can be uh, calculated or estimated as KAKS. Uh, and if it's greater than one, it's positive selection, right? And then the converse is this purifying selection, right? So this is an indicator of some type of adaptive evolution that can be occurring on these protein coding genes that I'm looking at. So another, uh, area to that uh, 
kind of background information. So looking at gene ontologies are these Go terms. So uh, Go terms are, are kind of like this hashtag for a particular gene. As I'm scanning through thousands of different genes that I'm interested in what, uh, what these genes encode for, and as you can see in my example here, I'm using MHC uh, class two, and you can see that there's this Go term where um, antigen processing and presentation, and so it gives a lot of description of that particular gene. And then as you can see, as you go higher up, uh, it's a more broader term for it, or it's a more um, uh, generic term for it, right? And they're kind of broken down into these three major domains, right? So biological process, molecular function, and cellular component. And so what I've done with my transcriptomes from brain tissues from these five species that I collected um, is identify the ortholog clusters. Again, it's the same gene, but different species. And I was able to identify 3,800 um, ortholog clusters, right, using um, these bioinformatic pipelines. And so what I've done with these ortholog clusters is um, estimating positive selection using a program called PAML, and which I use a branch sites model. So the null hypothesis is that we don't see positive selection operating on these branches here, right? And then the alternative hypothesis is that here with the star indicating that there is this uh, branch leading for positive selection. And as you can see on top of that, it says Terrapodus. So that's the subgenus uh, for, for the, the three species that, that you see in that clade. And then below it is Sebastostomus, which is another subgenus. And so through my analyses, um, I was able to identify 400 genes under positive selection. So here, uh, these 400 genes, um, I identified them also uh, included for a false discovery rate uh, to factor in for the multiple comparisons that I did with all these ortholog clusters. And so now the question beckons is, all right, what is it about these 400 genes? You know, what is unique about these genes and particularly pertaining towards uh, depth adaptations? And so what I've done is display them using a Rovigo plot and so as looking at the x-axis is our KAKS, and then the y-axis has no intrinsic value. So you just see uh, each point um, just spread out throughout the space. And each circle represents a single Go term, but that Go term was associated with a particular gene that I found under positive selection. And also the color is a bit of a redundancy where you can see that it's also an indication of KAKS. Right, and as you can see on that far right, right, that two really pop out, right, the, these two red ones where you see oxygen transport and engulfment of apoptotic cell, right? And so this was really interesting in seeing like, okay, what is it about these two genes in particular? Well, um, and how they relate to depth. And the one that I've kind of looked at or kind of honed in and focused on was this oxygen transport. And so what that Go term was appended to was, um, was hemoglobin subunit alpha. And so this was really interesting. So as I was going through this analysis that I've noticed that uh, just the KAKS value was 999. And that's just the way that the, the program works in the sense that there was only non-synonymous substitutions. There's no synonymous substitutions that were identified. And being the fact that this is hemoglobin, um, I, was, I was curious about what was going on with hemoglobin subunit beta. So I went back through my transcriptomic data sets to look for uh, uh, the subunit beta, and sure enough, I found it, but it was under pure fine selection. In addition, what I've been able to do is use uh, the tiger and the flag genomes, uh, which are publicly available on NCBI. And also, as you can see, they have different depth profiles. Um, so what I was able to do was to pull out hemoglobin subunit alpha genes from those two genomes and uh, use them in my analyses. So as you can see that I have this amino acid sequence alignment, where I've also included those two species as well. So here I have seven rockfish species that, that I'm um, analyzing. And what I've also done was that I've looked at or trying to identify paralogs of this uh, hemoglobin subunit alpha within rockfishes. So as you can see in teal um, is the analysis that I just showed you in that previous slide. Um, and when we include tiger and flag rockfishes that we see the signal of positive selection. Uh, just by scanning the genomes of the tiger and the flag rockfishes alone, um, I was able to identify um, an additional hemoglobin subunit alpha gene, uh, which is under uh, selection as well, so that box in red that you see. And then I found this third one that's uh, below that was also under selection, right, which also included um, some of the species uh, in, within my analysis, right, some from the transcriptomic data sets that I have. So in conclusion, that 
I see the strong signal of positive selection in these uh, hemoglobin subunit alpha genes, right, across five species, and we can even further extend it to the seven species. Um, that there's these paralogs within hemoglobin subunit alpha, right, which also show this sign of positive selection. Right, so really this also beckons, a, is this the opportunity to sequence more transcriptomes or genomes from rockfish species to look at these hemoglobin genes, right? I've only shared seven species and I had mentioned that there's 105 species of rockfishes. So there's plenty of more um, species to really, to get a better understanding of how, how hemoglobin is probably playing a strong role in, in terms of depth adaptations. Also, I just as a plug-in, I uh, wanted to share that I'm very fortunate to have an assistant faculty position at Cal State San Bernardino. So I do plan on continuing my rockfish work in uh, sampling along the coast of California, even into Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And I'm looking for students to join my lab. So if you're interested in a master's project uh, on rockfishes or any other uh, fish genetic projects, uh, I'd be more than happy to chat and talk about this further, and um, either you can email me or tweet me, and um, I'll be glad to, to share my ideas or we can talk more about this. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Andy Aguilar, who helped me throughout uh, my projects, uh, throughout my PhD dissertation, and also my colleagues. And lastly, I'll take any questions.